All right, I'll go ahead and get started, um, and I'm going to try to be brief. Um, I'm, I'm embarrassed to point out uh, a typo on my title slide, which is kind of a bad sign. I hope that's some sort of subconscious reference to me being congenial and not like a Freudian, Freudian avoidance of genital. Um, but I'm, I'm going to try to make this uh, quick. I'm talking about single ventricle, which is different from a lot of the other topics that we've discussed already, because it's really a grab bag of a whole lot of different disorders. Um, incidence is about four to eight per 10,000 live births. And, um, and often we have kind of this classic, this is a double inlet left ventricle with two AV valves coming into a left ventricle. There's a VSD to a little right ventricular outflow chamber here. Um, one of the classic forms of single ventricle. Here's hypoplastic left heart syndrome over here with a mitral valve atresia and a tiny little left ventricle. And so these are the, kind of the classic univentricular hearts where all the atrial blood enters into, into one ventricle and then you have a smaller ventricular outflow chamber that, that's relatively non-functional. The harder ones are these functional single ventricles and nothing, I'm a pediatric cardiologist and an adult congenital heart disease doctor and really nothing makes me more uncomfortable than that, okay, the mitral valve is a little bit small, the left ventricle is a little bit small, the left ventricular outflow is a little bit small. Is this patient amenable to a biventricular repair or do we need to go down a single ventricular pathway um, it is a challenging decision with some of these functional ventricles. So typically these kids presented with cyanosis. Sometimes they presented with acute decompensation as the ductus closed. Um, sometimes they presented with progressive heart failure and pulmonary overcirculation um, in the newborn or kind of further into the infant period. Um, but nowadays we typically diagnose this in utero. Unless there's uh, really poor prenatal care, it's fairly rare for a single ventricle to be born uh, without us knowing about it. And as a pediatric cardiologist, my initial decision is, does this patient need a ductus? Do I need to start them on prostaglandin to keep the ductus arteriosus open? Is it a ductal-dependent pulmonary circulation? Is it a ductal-dependent systemic circulation? Um, here's a, an echocardiogram from a for a double inlet left ventricle. You see the, the two va uh, AV valves entering into that LV and a VSD here with a smaller right-sided outflow chamber. Um, this is from a 38-year-old patient of mine who actually is currently waiting for a heart liver transplant because of hepatocellular carcinoma, which Dr. Johnson will, um, I'm sure, mention in his talk about Fontans. Um, but we're not, I don't have to do that. So I'm going to, in the mat... I'm going to skip through some of these in the, uh, for time's sake. This is a, a pulmonary atresia, a tiny little uh, tricuspid valve, tiny little RV. So there are lots of different types of single ventricles. The gist of this slide is if you don't intervene on single ventricles, they don't do well. It's very rare for these patients to live into adulthood without any sort of intervention. And I would say that the real numbers are worse than this because all the adult data we have uh, really is looking at single left ventricles, the hypoplastic left heart syndrome patients, which make up the majority, or at least is the most common single ventricle. These patients, until the early 80s with the advent of the Nor Norwood procedure, really uh, all died within the first couple of weeks to a couple of months of age and, and aren't included um, in a lot of the outcomes uh, data for single ventricles. And I think as adult congenital heart disease doctors, we all kind of live in fear of the, this coming tide of hypoplastic left heart syndrome patients that are going to be entering into our adult congenital heart disease uh, clinics. So most of these early patients, it was a question of pulmonary blood flow. This is tricuspid atresia. Here's tricuspid valve atresia with no VSD and pulmonary valve atresia. And the problem here is pulmonary blood flow. If the ductus arteriosus closes, there is no pulmonary blood flow. Um, so we know this patient is going to be blue and they're going to decompensate acutely if that ductus closes. Kind of the opposite problem here. Here's our tricuspid atresia, but there's a big VSD and there's no pulmonary stenosis. Pulmonary blood flow is not a problem for this patient. The problem is, is the pulmonary vascular resistance falls, as it typically does in the first several weeks to months after life, 
the, the pulmonary circulation is going to be flooded with blood flow. And the patient's going to have heart failure and failure to thrive uh, and do poorly, potentially die from heart failure or develop Eisenmenger syndrome. And then there are these rare patients that maybe are the, you know, the three bears just right. Um, maybe there's some obstruction at the VSD or there's pulmonary stenosis where you've got enough uh, stenosis to pulmonary blood flow to prevent overcirculation, but not so much that your SATs are prohibitively low. And this may be that rare patient that could live into adulthood with no intervention. Um, this is, if I can sign this for people, this is my drawing. Um, so here's our tricuspid atresia. The blue blood is going to go across the atrial septum, mix with the pink blood into the left ventricle, out the aorta, and we need this ductus to provide pulmonary blood flow. Um, so the initial uh, surgery, really kind of the modern era for this, started in the 40s with the uh, blaylock talsic thomas shunt, uh, with the left subclavian being uh, inserted down into the left pulmonary artery. There has been a, kind of a, a host of different shunts used. Um, the Waterston and the Pot shunts have been mentioned earlier in talks. Um, traditionally now, we are going to see a modified blaylock talsic shunt. So a tube that's man-made that has a fixed length and a fixed diameter to help restrict pulmonary blood flow to prevent overcirculation compared to the classic shunt the subclavian artery is spared um, and, and an overall a better uh, short-term solution. Here is the opposite problem. So we looked at tricuspid atresia and we had uh, ductal dependent pulmonary circulation. Um, this is the opposite. This is hypoplastic left heart. We have mitral atresia here, tiny little LV aortic atresia. So pink blood is having to go across an atrial septal defect mixed with the blue blood out the pulmonary artery and now I need that ductus to get blood to the systemic circulation. So not only is that ductal flow need to go down the descent and aorta, it actually has to go backwards to supply the head all the way down to the coronary arteries arising from that hypoplastic aorta. And this is an innately more unstable disease. Some uh, echocardiographic images of hypoplastic left heart, which I will blow through in the interest of time. Um, why is hypoplastic left heart so much more difficult to care for in the newborn period? Um, we've started prostaglandin, the ductus is open, they should be okay. The problem is pulmonary and systemic blood flow. So pink blood is gonna mix with the blue blood and it's sitting right here. And now it's got a decision to make. Is it gonna go across the ductus to the systemic circulation or out to the lungs? And that's all pulmonary vascular resistance to systemic vascular resistance. So let's say exactly one, let's make some assumptions. We'll say our pulmonary venous sats are 100 and our mixed venous sats are 60%. If exactly half that blood goes to the lungs and half the blood goes to the body, so a pulmonary to systemic blood flow ratio of one to one, your sats are gonna be about 80%. Now the pulmonary vascular resistance falls after birth and it keeps falling. And what if now five times as much blood is going to the lungs as is going to the body? The sats are higher. Sounds like a good thing, but actually it's a bad thing. It's a harbinger of too much pulmonary blood flow, wet, stiff lungs that don't work well, a baby that's having to work really hard to breathe because their, their lungs are overflow with blood, but also decreased systemic perfusion. And this ventricle, this right ventricle, is having to work exceptionally hard because every time it squeezes, just to get one, enough blood out to the systemic circulation, five times as much blood is going out to the lungs. And those coronaries are having to be supplied by blood going across the ductus and back down towards the coronaries. So this is an unstable situation. And things that make this worse are gonna be anything that lower your pulmonary vascular resistance, supplemental oxygen, hyperventilation with a low PCO2, or anything that raises your systemic uh, vascular resistance. So acidosis, hypothermia, pain, inotropes like, a, like epinephrine or norepinephrine that raise your systemic vascular resistance, or anything that closes that ductus. If the ductus closes, you're in trouble. So how do we treat these patients after we, st we obviously start prostaglandin to keep that ductus arteriosus open, but we also minimize the oxygen we give them. We try to avoid hyperventilation. Um, we don't forget the calcium because the neonatal myocardium is extremely sensitive to calcium. Um, and 
Sometimes we have to intubate, sedate, and paralyze those patients, but typically we don't. Usually we can leave them extubated um, and let them breathe on their own. So the Norwood operation, um, a much bigger surgery uh, than the Blalock talsic shunt that's going to be done for the tricuspid atresia, uh, ductal dependent pulmonary circulation, we have to create an aorta. Um, and so the pulmonary valve is basically hooked into this tiny ascin and aorta and a big patch is placed. So we've turned the pulmonary valve into an aortic valve and now we have to get pulmonary blood flow. So that's typically a, a, a blalock talsic uh, thomas shunt or more and more a sano shunt from the right ventricle out to the pulmonary arteries. Um, so we'll go back to our tricuspid atresia model. So here's a patient that's been palliated with a shunt. They are still blue, right? Blue blood here across the atrial septum mixes with the pink blood out the aorta, and some of that blood goes to the lungs. This ventricle is having to work very hard because it's having to supply pulmonary and systemic circulation. So we're blue and we're volume overloaded. Um, so the next step in the palliation is typically a Glenn. In the 1950s, Glenn kind of published his uh, initial work with the classic Glenn, which was the superior vena cava being hooked directly to the right pulmonary artery. Now a bidirectional Glenn is typically performed, so the shunt has been taken down and the SVC has been hooked into the pulmonary arteries. You're still blue. Blue blood from the lower body is coming into the atrium, mixing with the pink blood out the aorta, but this ventricle is much happier because now it only has to pump blood to the body. It doesn't have to supply the pulmonary blood flow. So it does get rid of the volume load um, on that ventricle. Why don't we just do this to begin with? Well, the pulmonary vascular resistance in the newborn is too high, hooking the superior vena cava up directly to those lungs, and a one-week-old wouldn't work because of that pulmonary vascular resistance. So typically in the kind of two to six-month range, around five kilograms is when this is done. Um, this is just to point out that there are patients, at least as of 2014, there were patients still alive with classic Glenn's. And I bring that up because there is this kind of dogma that these single ventricles get a shunt, they get a Glenn, then they get a Fontan. Um, and as Dr. Johnson will talk about in the next talk, there are a lot of problems with the Fontan, and maybe we need to rethink this. Maybe not everybody needs a Fontan. Maybe a Glenn is enough for some of these patients. I'm going to skip through that. So finally, we talked about what's done here where there's no pulmonary blood flow and we keep the ductus open with prostaglandin and then do a blalock talsic shunt. Um, we talked about this rare patient that maybe is perfectly balanced and doesn't need anything right away. What about this patient? So the patient with unrestricted pulmonary blood flow who has the pulmonary vascular resistance falls, they're gonna overflow their lungs with too much flow. Um, well, that may be a pulmonary arterial band procedure exactly what it sounds like. A string is tied around the pulmonary artery to create pulmonary stenosis, increase resistance to flow out to the lungs, and hopefully give you enough pulmonary blood flow to have sats that allow you to grow, but not so much that you're in heart failure, and importantly, not so much that the distal pulmonary vascular bed is exposed to high pressures. And that is it.